On March 23rd, 2003, Private First Class Jessica Lynch was captured during the Iraq War. She was badly injured and held in an Iraqi hospital for nine days. News of her capture and subsequent rescue gripped America. Former POW Jessica Lynch is recovering today at a military hospital in Germany. The pretty teenager ambushed, held captive, and then rescued in daring fashion. She is a new American hero. But it's unclear whether she's aware of her overnight celebrity. NBC even made a TV movie about her called Saving Jessica Lynch. Jessica, Jessica Lynch, we're United States soldiers and we're here to take you home. But Jessica was not the only soldier captured on that day back in 2003. Five other Americans were held in captivity, including U.S. Army Specialist Shoshana Johnson, who had recently joined the military. And I thought, okay, just do the job and come home. I never thought 30 days later I'd be a POW. While the media fawned over Lynch, a young, blonde, white woman from West Virginia, Shoshana Johnson, a black woman born in Panama and raised in Texas, went largely ignored. That's despite the fact that military service is in her bones. I actually just came back from uh, visiting my great uncle Al, 90 years old, Hmm. still kicking. There we go. And we talk, you know, veteran to veteran, and he talks about the struggle. Coming to the U.S., being a black man, and serving, yet still being held back simply for the color of your skin. Black people like Shoshana, her great uncle, and other members of her family have been serving in the U.S. military for centuries. There was the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, the all-black unit who fought in the Revolutionary War. And in the Civil War, the black soldiers in the Union Army helped turn the tide against the Confederacy. And despite Lincoln getting all of the credit, these black men helped free their own people from bondage. Black soldiers have always been there, hundreds, thousands of them, both free and enslaved, risking their lives and winning battles for America before this country was even fully formed, fighting for this country's freedom and liberty when they themselves were denied the same freedoms. I can't help but think of Harriet Tubman, who became a soldier and a spy for the Union Army during the Civil War. Tubman was the first woman, not the first black woman, the first woman to ever lead combat troops in the U.S. She gathered intel behind enemy lines, led raids to help free hundreds of people, and recruited some of them into the army, all with no compensation. I also think of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II, also known as the Red Tails, the first black Air Force pilots to man planes after the military dropped its policy of keeping them out of the cockpit. And then, of course, I think about the Vietnam War. It was the first war in which black and white troops were not segregated. But in the height of the war, black men were overrepresented in the draft and were far more likely to see combat. American history is littered with stories of black people who sacrificed for the flag, who gave so much to a country that didn't always give back. And Shoshana Johnson is one of them. Freedom has a taste. The protected will never know. I'm Tremaine Lee, and this is Into America. For Veterans Day, the story of Shoshana Johnson, the first black female prisoner of war, and the courage, struggle, and sacrifice of what it means to be a black patriot. Former Army Specialist Shoshana Johnson is 48 years old. We caught up with Shoshana at her house in El Paso. And thank you very much, Shoshana, for your all this time. Really do appreciate it. No problem. I hope it works out okay. No, it's great. I got to put my fish in the oven. I'm cooking lunch for the gentleman. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh ain't that a little lucky in him? <laughs> Get some of that good Texas home cooking. <laughs> a TV crew also came for the interview, and Shoshana was making them lunch. Clearly, I was just a little bit jealous. So, Shoshana, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
what is there to say? I am a black female immigrant from the Republic of Panama, army veteran, mom, sister, daughter, friend, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm a good friend. Shoshana's parents immigrated from Panama when she was a little girl. Once they got to the U.S., her dad joined the army and served for 21 years. His job took them all over, but El Paso was often home. I'm the oldest of three girls from Claude and Eunice Johnson. Claude and Eunice had a house full of females. <laughs> uh, Drill Sergeant Johnson was uh, very strict, <laughs> but we all, always felt the love. My dad made a point of telling me and my sisters that he loved us and that he did things for us to be able to dream big and accomplish. A military man, 20 years. What was your like experience with that growing up in that household? But also, what was your perception of the military having a father that had served so long? Being immigrants, there's a certain way in our culture that you do and don't do. And my parents really reinforced the old school mentality, showing proper respect, but also encouraging us to think outside the box, especially as black females. He always told us, you know, you got two strikes against you. You're black and you're female. So you have to be smarter. You have to be faster at everything you do. Hmm. As a drill sergeant, he would like give certain orders. But my mom was always the one, hey, 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 you ain't got no soldiers up in here. <laughs> you right. got daughters. <laughs> hmm. Now, he was a black man in the military. Yes. How do you think his blackness and being a black man shaped his experience? And did he ever talk about that? Um, sometimes you could see it. You know, my dad worked extremely hard and you could see how he was like sometimes the best person, highly starched uniform, shine boots, yet that promotion was not coming as quick. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the struggle. But also he made it clear that being in the U.S., he had more of a fighting chance than he did at home. Shoshana says she always wanted to follow her dad's footsteps and join the military, but her parents insisted she go to college first. So she did, but maybe had a little too much fun. Drill Sergeant Johnson was strict. So once I got that freedom, you know, that freshman year in college, I had a really good time. Q dog parties were the bomb. <laughs> Mm, uh -oh. I had a wonderful time in college, and my, my grades reflected that. Shoshana dropped out. She kicked around for a bit and decided maybe culinary school could be next. You know, my parents were like, that's wonderful. But you messed around the first time, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to pay for it on your own. Mm. You're going to have to learn that struggle. And I went to the military. It was what I really wanted to do in the first place. And I said, well, I know how to make it happen. So in the fall of 1998, Shoshana enlisted in the Army. She was sent to Fort Jackson, North Carolina for basic training. It was a struggle. I was 25 years old. I never ran two miles in mm. my life. Talking about you want to be a soldier, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I fractured my foot a couple weeks in. Mm. So instead of it taking eight weeks to go basic training, it took me six months because I had to rehab and then go back into it. But I was determined. I was not going to quit. I was going to finish this. Hmm. And I remember my parents coming to the basic training graduation. They were like, oh, Lord, thank God she finished something. Hmm. You know. <laughs> Shoshana ended up as an Army specialist, working as a cook. She was stationed in Colorado Springs and later in Texas. But then on 9-11, everything changed. President George W. Bush declared a war on terror and in early 2003, the U.S. was poised to invade Iraq. And Shoshana started hearing rumors about deployment. I came home to El Paso. I requested to be stationed at Fort Bliss because I had a two-year-old daughter. So my parents were there to help me out. We started getting word. You know, you hear things through the grapevine. Mm -hmm. We're going to deploy. We're going to deploy. And I was like, ugh, I got a baby. I ain't deploying. Mm. But, you know, when it comes down to it, I signed on the dollar line. Nobody forced me. I went. And I really didn't think it was a big deal. My sister had just gotten back from her deployment. You know, my dad had gone to Desert Storm. My uncle had gone to Desert Storm. My aunt, you know, 
it was no big deal for us. We just got up and I remember going to the family center while we were saying bye to my parents, my sister, my daughter. My parents were like, okay, we see you in a couple months and everything. Hmm. Shoshana and her unit, the 507th Maintenance Company, arrived in Kuwait in February 2003, one month before the U.S. invaded Iraq. She was 30 years old. And I thought, okay, I was going to save some money. I was going to lose some weight. Hmm. (laughs) You know, that was basically it. Just do the job and come home. Wow. But then you, you get there. Did things change immediately? No, not even. We got into Kuwait, and they had the little tent cities and stuff like that, and I, I didn't think anything of it. I'm a cook in a maintenance unit for Patriot missiles. Patriot missiles have to stay so far back in order to shoot down enemy missiles. And I'm the maintenance unit that, you know, helped them take care of that. It never occurred to me that I'd be even leaving Kuwait to go to Iraq. Mm. And I remember when they said, okay, we're about to pack up and move. I said, move where? Where are we going? Right, right. Wow. And I remember my NCO said, I don't know, Johnson. They just telling us we moving. I was like, oh, Lord. Mm. And I remember writing my dad, uh, sending an email, and I said, I don't trust my leadership. Wow. I don't trust my leadership. You don't trust your leadership? What did that mean? I mean, I, I'm military family. Although I'm a cook, I know, you know how things work, and it didn't make sense. And I'm not talking about like my immediate leadership, my company or, or stuff like that, because things go way higher than that. But it didn't make sense for us to be moving this far into Iraq. It didn't make sense to me. There was a trust issue for me. The Iraq war began on March 20th, 2003. Just three days later, Shoshana and her unit were part of a large convoy that was heading for the city of Nazaria. So what day did this ambush happen? Do you remember the the exact day? March 23rd, 2003, a Sunday morning. We're rolling in heavy, heavy vehicles. And that sand, if you get caught up, it just, your tires just keep rolling and rolling. Once we started moving, you know, you see vehicles getting bogged down. And I remember they were stopping trying to get a vehicle out. And I was like, didn't they tell us to just drop the vehicle and leave and pick up, you know, keep going? Mm. We ended up falling so far behind as we go into the city of Anazaria, the sun was coming up. And then we get like good ways into the city and we end up turning around. And, you know, we stopped for a second and they said, you know, the city isn't secure. We got to get out of here. So we roll back around and then that's when the ambush started. They cut down our small convoy into three sections. You could hear gunfire and so forth. I remember um, my vehicle gets disabled. My sergeant comes running up and I'm like, okay, what do we do? I jump out the vehicle. He's like, take cover. We get underneath the vehicle. I get shot. Hernandez gets shot. Sergeant Riley, you know, asks for my weapon because his his had jammed. And I remember distinctly, I handed him my weapon badly and it caught sand in it. So it jammed. And then he was like, you know, we can't, we can't return fire. We can't defend ourselves. He goes, we're going to have to surrender. And he says, they've got Miller over already. So he goes up from out the, underneath the vehicle with his hands up. And I'm thinking to myself, they're going to mow him down. And they didn't. And then Hernandez goes, and then I could feel uh, them pull me by my legs from underneath the vehicle. And they start wailing on us. I mean, they gave us a good whooping the ends of the rifles, kicking and stuff. And then my Kevlar, my helmet falls off and my braids come out. They's like step back in shock. They notice I'm a female and they back off and they drag me over to a vehicle, throw me in the back and separate me from the men. Hmm. That sounds like a terrifying experience. It was. What were you going through in, the, in that moment? 
were you thinking that this could be this could be it? Yeah. And you think of it because there was a point underneath the vehicle where a RPG comes close and I turn my head because I know it's going to go off and it's a dud. Wow. And I was like, oh God. Then as you go through, I'm like, oh my God, this is it. And then I was like, no, I made it this far. I made it this far. And that's what goes through my, through my whole captivity. That's what goes through. Oh my God, this is it. And then I say, no, I made it this far. There's a reason. You know, so my mind keeps going through that story, through the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, we were moved around seven times. We went from prisons to jails. And, and there's a point where they kept us in people's homes. And that's the scary part because they're looking for us. They can't search every home in Iraq. How many of of you all were captured and how many of you were being moved place to place? Were you kept in the same facility or how did that work? From 507th Maintenance Company, it was me, Joseph Hudson, James Riley, Patrick Miller, and Edgar Hernandez. We were captured immediately and taken and separated. When they went back to check the vehicles, they found Jessica alive and took her to the hospital in Anazaria. Me and the guys were driven to Baghdad for interrogations and put into prison. Later on that night, two Apache pilots were shot down and joined us in captivity. For the duration of the, my captivity, we are all kept in separate cells. But as they moved us, they would start to put the men together and keep me separate. It was only in the last two places that I was put with the men and I actually got to see them. During the captivity, we tried to talk to each other and stuff like that as much as we could. But most of the time, I was alone. I had long talks with God. Mm. <laughs> you know, I thought I, every wrong I ever did and, you know, prayed for forgiveness. Mm. But I, I, I really, really wanted to see my daughter grow up. That was a big thing for me. I didn't have to worry about her care because I know my parents. I know my family. Yeah. Not just my parents, my sisters, my aunts, my cousins. I knew she was good. Going to be well taken care of and she would always remember me. But I wanted to be there for the big moments. Were, were there moments in this ordeal, you'd be moved from facilities to people's homes, where you seriously thought that you might not make it back stateside to see your daughter? Were there like real moments where you said, you know what? This might be it. Two big incidents. The U.S. was bombing Baghdad and they dropped a bomb close to my oh, prison. Man. And it blew the roof off, <laughs> part of the roof up and everything. And one of the first things that happened is the guards took off and left us there locked in our cells. So I was like, are they going to come back? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> We're locked in cells. Are they going to come back or, or what's going to happen? So that was a close one. And then the, one of the times they were moving us in the middle of a firefight. So we're in the van as they're moving us and we could hear a firefight going on between the U.S. and Iraqi forces. I mean, and they were barely missing us. And you couldn't tell who was missing us, the Americans or the Iraqis. So I was like, man, wouldn't it be something if I end up dying by friendly fire? Talk to us about your injuries. You were shot, but talk about your injuries. I, I was shot in both legs. We still don't know if it was one bullet that hit both legs or two bullets. Um, it went through the calf of the right leg, tearing up the Achilles. Um, on the left leg, it uh, went through the ankle, fracturing a bone. So I still got my legs, though. I, I don't, I'm blessed. I got medical care from the Iraqis. I don't know if I would have been able to either survive or even keep my legs if they hadn't given me proper medical care. Hmm. I didn't realize how much damage was done. They did a surgery. They did surgery on you? Like the Iraqis? Yes. First time I've ever had surgery in my life. And they put me underneath general anesthesia. Wow. And at the time, Baghdad was being bombed. I remember being in that hospital and the building rattling because the bombs are dropping. 
and they put me underneath general anesthesia to fix my legs. I don't know why they did it, but I'm thankful that they did. Mm -hmm. So all these years later, there are layers from which to view the entire experience, right? And you yes. went through this, and after spending um, all those days in captivity, talk about the moment you were finally freed and how that happened. Um, Sunday morning, Palm Sunday, they were giving us breakfast, and the door got kicked in. Talking about get down, get down, and I was so happy. I knew I was going home. The Marines got control of the room, hustled us out of that house, and I remember I was holding on. I said, because I'm not going to be the first one to cry. I, mm. As the only female, I was like, I'm not going to be the first one to cry. That damn ain't going to burst yet. They said, you know, make a run for that vehicle right there. And that's when I broke down. And I was like, I can't run. My legs are <laughs> messed up. And a Marine wrapped the arm around me and half carried, half dragged me to that vehicle to make sure I got in. And they got us to safety. It, it was, I can't explain the joy. The joy. Hmm. And I'm, I'm still in contact with quite a few of them Marines, too. That's all right. I mean, look, looking around like, yo, is, this, is this real? Like, <laughs> it's like a movie. It was yeah. really like a movie. The drama. It was very dramatic. And I, I'm eternally grateful for those Marines. Wow. They're just awesome. By the time she was rescued, Shoshana had been in captivity for 22 days. A handful of you all were captured, but how many didn't make it out of that initial firefight, the initial ambush? Eleven died. Nine from my unit and two others that were with us. How do you, how do you balance that um, gratefulness of surviving, even though you're wounded, um, but knowing that so many of your fellow soldiers you know, were killed? I don't think I do. I still feel a lot of guilt. Mm. There were good people, 19, 18, you know, 21. Um, James Keel, his wife was pregnant. You know, his son was born after he died. There were young, extremely young, and his... Uh, you know, a question I ask myself, Lorianne Piestua, Native American female that died, first Native American female prisoner of war, and she had two kids. And our daughters are the same age. So why did I come home and she didn't? You know, I'm sorry. No, of course. All, all these years later, talking about your fellow soldiers still brings you to tears. Because they were awesome people. You know, people you fussed and fight with, but people who had my back, who had my back. You know, I can't explain how that feels to know that you're going into this and people are trying to kill you. Yet the person to my left and the person to my right are willing to die to help me get there. I think of those Marines that came to the rescue who took a chance. The intel wasn't sound. They took a chance with their own lives so I can go home to raise my child. I think people like to say thank you for your service and don't understand what it is that these men and women do. There are points in the time when you think you can give your life, maybe give a limb, and for some of them, for some of them, it feels like they're given a part of their soul to do what they do every day. Mm. We throw around the word sacrifice easily and hero easily, um, but that sounds like real sacrifice. I don't think I fully understand the word sacrifice. When you hear that, I don't know if we are using it the right way. You know, there's a, a saying from a Vietnam POW, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it exactly. Freedom has a taste. The protected will never know.
We'll be right back. After Shoshana and the other soldiers were captured in March of 2003, a video was released by Iraqi soldiers. You can see Shoshana as they interrogate her, her eyes darting around anxiously. What's your name? Shana. Shana? Yes. Where are do you come from? Texas. You come from Texas? Yes. Shoshana's father was flipping through the channels, looking for cartoons to show her daughter when he saw that video on the news. That's how he learned Shoshana, his firstborn, was a prisoner of war. For Shoshana's family, that was the last image they had of her until her rescue. Well, here's Shoshana today uh, being taken into custody by a U.S. Marines north of Baghdad. And uh, she and the other seven POWs are reportedly on their way to Kuwait. They're going to get uh, medical attention. And we hope uh, as soon as is feasible, they'll have a chance to speak to their families. But uh, Claude and Eunice Johnson couldn't even bear to watch the reruns of that tape of their daughter. Well, I'm sure they're going to be looking at the uh, tape and the pictures of her being brought back to safety. And uh, that will... I remember... We get to Doha, Kuwait, and I, you know, we're getting later in the evening, and I'm the only one that hasn't talked to their family. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on? You know, and I was upset and everything, and they finally get a hold of my parents. Oh, and I, you know, I break down and talk to my parents, and I was like, where were y'all? And my mom was like, we were doing an interview. I said, Ma. <laughs> And I was like, Ma, you didn't even know. She goes, of course we did. Congressman Reyes and Senator um, K. Bailey Hutchinson had already called us when we got the first report of the rescue. So my congressman, and this is a good thing, my Democrat congressman, my Republican senator, had contacted my family when they first got reports. And um, I'm proud of my, my representatives at the time who took care of my family like they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they knew I was okay, <laughs> but I was still mad. I was like, look, y'all could have talked to me first before right, you. <laughs> right. <laughs> what was that conversation like? I mean, finally being safe and talking to them. What was that conversation like? Uh, it was surreal. Actually, y'all at NBC <laughs> got a copy of it because I didn't know at the time <laughs> The NBC, I guess Stone Phillips and all them were at my house, my parents' house. Just imagine what it was like for the family of specialist Shoshana Johnson. Last night, Dateline NBC's Stone Phillips talked to her family after they had a reunion by phone. For me, all I wanted was to hear her voice. And shortly after I heard her voice, and she said, Dad, and that was it. Dad? Shauna, how are you? I'm okay. Uh, it is so, so very good to hear from you. Besides um, the wounds, you all right? Oh. Right here, hold on. She's, she's fine. Shauna? Hey, Shauna. Hey, but you're all right, Mama. Shauna, you're all right, okay? All you have to do is thank the Lord, okay? It was emotional talking, and then um, I got to talk to my daughter. You want to talk to mommy? Hold on, I got a little voice for you. That's mommy. Hello, mommy. Hey, mommy. Hello, mommy. Hi, and she was like, you know, you got an owie. And I was like, yeah, I do, sweetie. Mm. How, how old was your daughter then? Two. Oh, wow. A little baby. She was two years, yeah. I know it's heart-wrenching to listen to that call again, all these years later, but there was this one kind of really touching moment that I had to ask her about. Her main worry was people taking her picture and her hair looked terrible. <laughs> I did complain to my mom about my hair because I had seen some of the pictures they had taken as the Marine is escorting me off the helicopter. Sure, <laughs> are you worrying about your hair? 
Miss Lawson would braid the hair back right back up. What? Mama, that's the least of your worries. She worried about her hair. Of course, I did not know it was being recorded or I wouldn't have said such things. <laughs> You survived all this, and you're like, my hair look a little, little rough. A little <laughs> rough. It was tall up. I bet. I bet. <laughs> so you're, you're safe. You're connecting with your family. And I wonder sometimes we talk about this idea of things that happen in the fog of war, and just like you're in it, and there's firefights, and you're being rescued. And then you get back. What was it like getting back to the military? Like you had been out in the field and had been held hostage, and now you're back. What was that like? It wasn't that great. Mm. You know, I was dealing with a lot physically and mentally. But, you know, we got a lot of attention when we got home. And not everybody was okay with that. You know, so we had to deal with a little, you know, jealousy issues, which I think is ridiculous. Yeah. What do, you, what, do you, what do you mean people didn't like, how did that play out? Like in real time and you're there, how did, how did that actually play out? You know, there was... There was an incident where I had a senior person file a complaint against me. You know, I had housing on post and I shouldn't have because my parents had my daughter or something like that. What? I was like, are you for real? Shoshana says this senior person accused her of fraud, claiming that she was lying about having her daughter living with her on the base in order to get better housing. She told me her daughter would stay with her parents while she worked and traveled, but that was it. She lived with me. What is that about? Do you think were other people treated like that? And again, not to just necessarily put it squarely back on racism being, you know, doing what it does, but how much of it was about you being a black woman, you think? For that incident, I know it was because I was a black woman. Mm. I, I, I knew who it was, you know, and I know who he is. So that one was definitely about being a black female. There were other little things that the men endured too. You know, they get an the attitude because we got to go on little stuff and represent the military and stuff like that. The guys, the guys got the pushback too. There were other things like that that Shoshana noticed when she got back, like having to advocate for her benefits. Yeah, I had to fight hard. There was an incident when they were giving me my medical retirement. And they had categorized one of my gunshot wounds as arthritis. And then they wouldn't recognize my PTSD. Now, they medicated me for it enough so I can go and put on a uniform and represent the Army and do certain things. But they wouldn't acknowledge it. And that was the bottom line for me. You're going to acknowledge that this was hard. Hmm. I remember part of the paperwork saying, uh, I know your time in Iraq was trying. <laughs> Hold on. I don't, I don't want to laugh at this. This is not funny. It's not humorous. Your time in Iraq was trying? It's trying. Trying. Yes. Yes. I know your time in Iraq was trying, but condition A, PTSD, is not rateable. I was like, and I have that in writing. I kept that paperwork. <laughs> How angry. I'm angry now hearing this. I'm angry. <laughs> How angry were you trying? I was a prisoner of war. I was shot in my legs. I was, I was hot. I was hot. You know, and that was when I had to say, okay, enough, enough. Hmm. And I kept pushing until they gave, acknowledged it. They had to acknowledge it. And, and that became the thing with me and Lynch. They acknowledged hers and they wouldn't acknowledge mine. And uh, I want people to understand that's not her fault. That's the powers that be and the people who decided that her event was so much more traumatic than my event. I'm not trying to say we were the same, but give me the respect I'm due for enduring what I had to endure. I think many, many people, those of us who remember that time, you know, will remember Jessica Lynch a white woman captured around the same time, books and movies. And it was, you know, per the way America moves, if a black woman goes missing, we don't know that black woman's name. The blonde haired white girl, everybody is tripping over ourselves to, to we gotta find her. How did it play out in, in this situation, in your scenario, you were captured, Jessica Lynch was captured. How did you see this playing out the way you were treated and the way the, the media, the military, America responded to you 
and how they responded to Jessica Lynch? I, I think for the military aspect, I think people need to understand that uh, Jessica and I were in the same units and captured the same day, but we are kept separate. So when they rescued Jessica, a lot of them thought we were already dead. So they played up her rescue to make themselves, we got one, we rescued her, this and that. So that became an issue with the military. But as far as the media coverage, that that's, is what it is. We, you know, just as you said uh, about the, you know, and they played up the, you know, petite little blonde girl and oh my gosh, and was it fighting till all her bullets were left, which never happened. So the story was that she was just Rambo, just... Not happened. Hmm. After Lynch was rescued, an unnamed Pentagon official told the press that Lynch had been fighting to the death before she was captured. A report that Jessica shot several Iraqi soldiers before she was captured, even after she herself was shot. These stories turned out to be false. Lynch had actually been knocked unconscious when her vehicle was attacked and woke up in the hospital with crushed legs and a broken back. Lynch, who was medically discharged in August 2003, has been vocal in criticizing the military and press for these distortions. The media plays up what they want to play up. So um, there was some of it that I backed away from. I'm not going to lie. It became too much and I, I had to back away. Mm. But also, we as uh, Black people need to look deeper in within ourselves. I wasn't on the cover of Jet or Ebony or Essence either. Mm. Have, have you ever had a conversation with Jessica about any of this or just generally? We do talk about it every once in a while. I remember 2010, my book came out. There was a lot of hate, a lot of hate. And I spoke to her directly about the hate because I know she experienced some of that. I remember her telling me explicitly, Johnson, there's nobody that can correct you about what happened to you except us. Have any of us said anything to you that says you didn't do you know, anything? You didn't say something that wasn't true and stuff like that? And I said, no. She goes, then ignore them. You know what happened. You know your truth. And I will always take that with me because she's right. Nobody can correct me, except for those six guys that were with me and served with me. Hmm. So she was like, you know, no matter what they say on the outside, you know, you know, basically, you know who you are, you know what you did. Don't let all that noise get in your head. And I appreciate her always for giving me that insight. Got to shake them off. Now, you mentioned um, a name earlier that I want to circle back to is Lori. Yeah. And this idea of who's worthy of attention, who is and who gets the attention, all the noise surrounding all the folks who gave this ultimate sacrifice. And I want you to talk about Lori, because that's a name that I don't think most people have heard before in this situation. Lori Ann Piestua. Uh, she is a Hopi, a member of the Hopi tribe of Arizona. Um, she died of her wounds in Iraq during the ambush. A mother of uh, two children, Carla and Brandon. Uh, she was so sweet, so genuine, and so funny. Hmm. Um, she, uh, and not just Lori, her whole family. I remember uh, they would do the memorial for Lori because they na renamed a uh, mountain in Arizona after Lori. It was called uh, Squaw Peak, which is a derogatory name for Native American women. And they renamed it Piestawi Peak in her honor. And uh, I was invited every year, and it took about three years or four years before I would actually go because the anxiety about seeing her family and knowing that I lived and she died was a lot for me. And I remember getting there for the first time, and I started to cry. And her mom just embraced me and said, stop it. We are so blessed that you are still with us. And... What that family does, and they had been doing, was inviting parents who lost their children in Afghanistan and Iraq to come together and help each other heal as a place of healing. So that entire family just has a way about them to open their arms and make you feel at ease and help you through the day. My experiences with them helped me mentally. And so 
I, I can't even describe the words how much they helped me heal mm-hmm. as a whole. Wow. Um, but people don't know her name, and they should. You know, she made a great sacrifice. And as a Native American woman, given this country's history, the fact that she was willing to put on the uniform and, and she died for this flag that thought she, you know, ugh, it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, even when they were naming, renaming the mountain after her, people protested it. People protested that, talking about we should wow. like leave Squaw Peak alone. And I was like, it's derogatory. Hmm. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the name. I said, because it doesn't relate to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what it is. When you talk about um, her as a Native American or even uh, you know us Black people who serve, it's almost like the most American people of all are the most marginalized. Yes. Her sacrifice, which she was fighting for, what is quintessentially the most American, and the response That should be deemed as the un-American part. Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. Goes back to that, oh, thank you for your service, but you really don't mean it. You know, you still want to refer to a a mountain, that derogatory squaw, instead of giving it a warrior's name of the woman that sacrificed everything. You know, you still want to look at me sideways instead of recognizing that I put on a uniform and, and made my sacrifices Also, I got an email from a gentleman who said uh, how angry he was that a Negress like me was collecting benefits. He didn't say one word about my service that I dishonored the uniform or anything like that. It was just the fact that I was collecting benefits that I earned, that I earned. I would have had a push, you know, I could understand some of them say, well, you didn't do justice to the service. And we could argue back and forth about that. But his only thing was that I was a black female collecting my disability and all that kind of stuff for my service. Shoshana was medically discharged in December of 2003. She had served in the Army for five years. She was awarded the Bronze Star for heroic achievement, the Purple Heart, and the Prisoner of War Medal. Today, Shoshana is retired and spends her time volunteering and traveling as much as possible. And that wish she had when she was captured, she did get to see her daughter Janelle grow up. Janelle is 21. She's in college now at the University of Texas at Permian Basin in Odessa, about four hours away from El Paso. So life is pretty good, but Shoshana still struggles with PTSD. I've learned through the years and continued therapy how to deal and navigate my issues, but it's always going to be there. And I think that's something I had to learn. It's not going to disappear. It's a weight that I'll carry with me to my end, but it's uh, how you carry the weight, how you deal with the ups and downs, and how you live your life going forward. Hmm. I think one of the best things I've learned, especially with feeling the guilt of uh, surviving, is they wouldn't want me just to just hide in a corner. And I did that for a lot of years, locking myself in the house and not wanting to talk and just not wanting to be. That's not what they would want for me. Uh, especially Lori. She <laughs> She would have probably told me to take my head out of my Mm -hmm. ass and just keep going, (laughs) you know, and get up and do something. Shoshana still bears wounds, physical and mental, from her service. But these days, when Shoshana thinks of her fallen comrades, she also feels a sense of purpose. Every time I start to feel the weight of it and I have to think, is that what they would want for me? Is that why I'm still here. So I just have to uh, share the story. I hope it helps others, other veterans. hope it helps civilians understand the veteran community a little better, the female veteran community, and um, especially the black female veteran community. There's so few of us. 
and sometimes they just don't grasp what it's like. Mm -hmm. But if we don't share the story, then they'll never get it. Well, Shoshana, uh, thank you so much for your, your time, your sacrifice, and it's, it's an honor and a privilege to, to be able to lift your name and your experience mm, and, <laughs> and center your experience. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Now I got to go turn on the oven on my fish. <laughs> You can learn more about Shoshana's story in her book, I'm Still Standing. And you can tweet me at Tremaine Lee. That's at Tremaine Lee, my full name, or write to us, intoamerica at NBCUNI.com. That was intoamerica at NBC and the letters UNI.com. Into America is produced by Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, Joshua Sirodiak, and Aisha Turner. Original music is by Hannes Brown. Special thanks this week to Stephanie Cargill, along with Gary Boyer and Alan Green. I'm Tremaine Lee. Big shout to our veterans out there. We'll see you next Thursday.